Yeah. Okay. Today is August the 20th, 2020. And we're glad you joined us and those that are live streaming. We'll prepare ourselves in our usual fashion. I have a few moments of silent prayer, the option of rebound if necessary. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your faithfulness every single day. The sun comes up, the world keeps turning, the stars are in place. You hold the entire universe together because you are in control of the universe. You are the sovereign of the universe. The Lord Jesus created it. So we thank you for that. We hardly ever think about those things. We just know that they're going to happen. But it's all related to your faithfulness. And we can project that to the issues that each of us face collectively as we see our nation being destroyed one day at a time, one piece at a time. And yet we know that you are the one that is going to make the decision as to whether we stay a nation or not, whether we'll be destroyed or whether we're going to flourish. And it has everything to do with the attitude that the people of this country have towards you. You do not show partiality just because we are the United States of America. Many, many countries have gone the same route that it appears that we are going. But we have volition. We can make a correction in our direction that we're going. And that's what we all want to do personally, but we also want to do it collectively. And... We're not responsible for the collective, but we are responsible for each of our individual lives that we want to be good ambassadors to Jesus Christ. We know that you will enable us to do that, but enable to, to, to be able to do that, we need to know your word and be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in us for any person that asks. We need, need to be looking for opportunities to give the good news while we still have time. So we have this Bible class tonight. We pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate on it. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 1 verse 16. <clears throat> Excuse me. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And for those who are online, we will not have any notes for the folks here. They, they will get it online, though, won't they? See the notes? Then it come from our computer? Oh. Yeah, you can try it and see. I don't know. No? I didn't know that this depended on this up here. I thought it was reading it right off my computer. Huh. Well, we had one one disaster, not a disaster really, a uh, charge of the ant a couple of times already, but we'll persevere. So let's first get into Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This is, of course, the Apostle Paul that is saying that he's not ashamed of the gospel, and if anybody had a reason or a right to be ashamed about the gospel, it would be him because because not not because of Paul that anything was missing in him, but because he was talking to people who thought that if you worked with your hands, you were just well. They didn't have a, the term term blue collar workers, 
they just were condescending to anybody who worked there with their hands. They thought they weren't really all that important. And anyone who was crucified was considered a despicable criminal. And the gospel headquarters for Christianity at that time was Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was just one of the little towns that Rome had already conquered. It was no big deal. So there's nothing in the gospel message that would attract the Romans or the Gentiles, you might say. And yet that didn't deter Paul in the slightest because he knew that it was the power of God in that gospel and it's only the power of God in that gospel that has the power to change men. In fact, I think this might be a good place to start. Oh, I started to click there to show it to you. <laughs> this is all in capital letters, so it's really important. Only the proclamation of the gospel contains God's own power to save every soul that embraces it. That's the most simple way you could describe the Bible, excuse me, the, the gospel. The proclamation of the gospel, giving the gospel. Now just think about that a moment. Every time you give the gospel to someone, you are giving them messaging straight from God, that carries with it God's own power. So when you're giving somebody the gospel, it's not like you're telling them who won the Super Bowl or what happened. This is What you're doing there is supernatural. Because God takes the words that you use, the accurate words, in giving the gospel, and it unleashes the power of the Holy Spirit that can then work with that person to draw them, to work with them. Well, first of all, we know about common grace. You can be talking to a Muslim or a Hindu or anybody that has no reference for Jesus Christ or hardly the Bible or anything else, but the Holy Spirit will make it clear and perspicuous the spiritual phenomenon of the gospel, anyone can understand when you're giving it to them correctly. And the Holy Spirit will urge them. He will convict them. He will strive with them. He does all those things. What he will not do, which he cannot do, is to force them. Because God has given us volition and even God himself will not take that away. Now when we give the gospel, we don't necessarily feel a sense of God's power surging through us. In fact, a lot of times we might give the gospel and go away and we're kicking a can and we're, we're saying, well, I could have done better than that. I should have said this or I should have said that. It's my fault. And they rejected me anyway, so I really blew that one. That, that is not it at all. The only thing we're responsible for is giving it to them accurately. And that's not hard to do. And when you do that, you won't feel anything. And even though it may look like they are rejecting it, you may have planted a seed. You may have put a stone in their shoe where it's going to, bother them. The Holy Spirit is going to see to it. He's already made it clear to them. So why are we so adverse to giving the gospel? I, we went over that already. Because most people in our day and time show no respect for God, our church, our Jesus, or anything else. It used to be even unbelievers would give deference to someone he would be talking about God, but no more. They can openly mock him. They can deride you for being such a fool as to believe that fairy tale. They can reject you. They can make you feel horrible if you let them. So those are, there are reasons for you not to do it, but they pale in significance to what happens when you do give it. 
And by the way, we are commanded to give it, so that's a good reason in itself. Now we're to give it to everyone who believes. Well, excuse me, the, the power of the gospel is to everyone who believes. The believing ones, that sounds like a verb, but it's not. Notice that this is the only condition for eternal salvation is belief. Next time you hear the gospel from anybody, it might be on the radio, it might be on TV or somebody in person, or you might be reading something, I want you to just look for one word, believe. If the word believe is not in there, it's not an accurate gospel. I would say that it's impossible to give an accurate gospel without having the word believe in it because that is everything. I'm not saying it's everything that it has the power. Jesus Christ has the power. He's the object. But it's the only way to receive the free gift of eternal life and God's righteousness is by believing it. You can use the word trust, but that's the essence of it. So no water baptism, no repenting of sin, no asking Christ into your heart, no singing a sin, excuse me, saying a sinner's prayer, no asking for forgiveness, no promise of surrender, no walking an aisle, no making Jesus Lord of your life, no confession of sin, not calling on the name of the Lord and not coming to Jesus. None of those things will save you. Only faith alone in Christ alone will save you. Now the word believes, that I just mentioned, this is where I warned you last time, I'm going to get in the weeds here for a moment. Pretty deep in the weeds, but it won't last long. And I'll tell you why in a moment I'm going there. But let's look at the word believes first. It is the Greek word pistuo, P-I-S-T-E-U-O. It's a participle. It's a present active participle, single, dative, masculine. Now I usually don't give you the noun morphology of it usually because it's not it's not really conducive to what, we're, what, what, what we work with. But I did it this time for a purpose. Because a participle is a verbal. It sometimes can act as somewhat as a verb and somewhat as a noun or even like an adjective. And that's why it has the case uh, is a single dative a masculine is like a noun and the a present active is like a verb. Now, it, it means to trust oneself to an entity in complete confidence, believe in, to trust. We all know that that's what that means. Now we get into the weeds. Like I told you when I ended last time, I don't expect you to remember this. I don't expect you maybe even to understand it. But I'm going to give it to you, and the reason I'm giving it to you is to counter what some people say because this is a present active participle. They say that it's to the ones who keep on believing. And if you don't keep on believing because it's present tense, then you're not persevering, which means you weren't really saved to begin with. They add that to it because of this present tense. And because of that, I have to go into the grammar in, in the Greek to give you some information that proves that that's not so. And it's, 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 I'll do the best I can to simplify it. I'm not trying to be condescending at all. It's hard for me to even understand, but I've learned this a long time ago, and it makes a big difference. So, believe here is an articular present participle. Now, articular means that there's an article before the participle, and that makes a difference. So the articular present participle, which means the one who believes. 
Those who are into Reformed theology claim that the present tense implies that Jesus meant that whoever continues to believe has everlasting life. Thus the simple offer, offer of the gospel on the basis of faith alone becomes entirely different. I'm, I'm, I just dabbed in, dabbled in the weeds for a moment. I'll get back to it in a moment. This is a quote from Joseph S. Dillo, Reign of the Servant Kings. When Jesus said, whoever believes in him will have everlasting life, we are told that his true meaning was, whoever believes in him and continues to believe in him up to the point of physical death and who manifests evidence of having truly believed by practical works of holiness persevere to the end of their life, has everlasting life. Now, that is comes from Reformed theology. Sometimes they those that subscribe to Reformed theology are called Calvinists. Now, this would be a good time for me to do this. I, it's, it's, it's funny how sometimes God brings into things into my life which I have no idea why, and I can wind up using them in, in teaching. I received this book about three days ago. If it was from Moses on Rebecco. It's called The Gospel on Point, Sharpening the Sword by John Bruner. And uh, I think Moses may have had something to do with this, but John Bruner wrote it. And it's simply explaining how we need to be on point when we give the gospel. And he gives all the, the, the nonsense. Uh, you know, you would think that the, uh, the gospel is the most important thing we can impart to someone, and you think that the church would be right on target, that we'd all be in harmony of what it takes to be saved and given the gospel, and yet it's all over the place. And he's, he's explaining how to be on point, be accurate, and you can be brief. But this is why I brought this. This is, uh, in these two pages, on this page, he's got Blessed Assurance by Francis uh, J. Crosby. You all know the, word, the song, right? Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Now, what he's done is change the word to Blessed Assurance to Desperate Assurance. And if the Calvinists were going to sing blessed assurance in the, that lined up with what they believed, it would sound like what I'm about to read to you. I'll read it to you instead of singing to you. Well, I can, I'll sing it to you if you want. It doesn't matter. Which would y'all rather have? Sing it? Okay. I'm not going to be, I'm just going to carry a tune. And I'll tell you right from the beginning, it cracked me up. <laughs> and it's not laughable, but I couldn't help it. And you might laugh too. So if you think it's funny, feel free to laugh. We're not laughing at these people. We really should have our heart out to them because they have embraced something that is just not biblical. But this is the way it would sound if a, Cal a Calvinist was singing assurance. The reason it says desperate assurance because there is no way that a Calvinist can be certain that he's saved, much less even elect. You have to persevere to the end. How do you know you're going to persevere? And by what measure are you going to take to see if you are persevering or not? But anyway, here it goes. <clears throat> Desperate assurance, Jesus is mine. No, excuse me. I, I, I already messed up on the first one because I sang it like we always sang it. This is it again. Desperate assurance, is Jesus mine? Oh, was I chosen for glory divine? Heir of salvation, question mark, determined by God. Am I included, washed in his blood? This is my story all my life long. With the elect I hope to belong. This is my story all my life long, hoping my works may show I belong. Without volition, this is my plight, visions of rapture not yet in my sight. 
angels descending from orders above to only few to to only the few whispers of love perfect submission trying to rest hoping i'm chosen as part of the blessed working and wandering looking above only at death i'll know if i'm loved Now, if any Calvinists are watching this, I'm sorry, I did. <laughs> it, it, I couldn't help, but it, it, whoever thought of this, I think it was the guy that wrote the book, came up with that. It's really sad, but you have no hope of having any assurance, and that's what it's about. So, that goes along with what we just saw that whoever believes in him and continues to believe in him up to the point of physical death, and who also manifests evidence of having truly believed by practical works of holiness, persevered into the end, uh, to the end of life, has everlasting life, and that just would leave just about everybody out, I believe. I know it would leave me out. What is this? Okay. No, this, this isn't... Oh, you talking about the quote or the, what I just did? Yeah, the, that quote, what I just read was from Joseph Dillow. Okay. Okay, we're, you're ready about to get back in the weeds. We had a little levity there now. An articular present participle has an article before the participle which essentially removes the verbal aspects of the word. So when I'm studying and, I, and I'm looking for, I come to a participle, one of the first things I do is look, does it have an article before it? Because if it has an article before it, then it's an articular present participle, and it removes, for the most part, any aspects of a verb, and it becomes substantive as a noun. This form, this this form, for all intents and purposes, is a noun and not a verb. A noun by, you could say, instead of uh, uh, the power of God unto those who believe, you could say the power of God uh, unto the believing ones. See? That's in, in the believing ones. That, that would be sub substantive. Rather than the verb believes. Because when you look at it now, it's a present active participle, and it looks like it's a verb that has action, but actually with the articular form, the, uh, the article before removes the uh, aspects of the verb. This is by Marion Webster. The articular present participle rarely, if ever, has a durative force, an ongoing force, it is merely a substantive, which is a word functionally, functioning syntactically, syntactically as a noun. Okay? Now, present participles that do not have an article before them are called anarthrous. And I'm not sure of this spelling, but I think you spell it A-N-O-R-T-H-R-U-S. It would be an author's present participle, and they retain their verbal aspects. So if you have a participle, there's no article before it, then it acts more as a verb or an adverb, and it doesn't have, uh, if it does have an article, it is not, not according to, to this, have the durative force. Now, I'm sorry I had to do that to you, but what I'm saying is there, what that means is that those that say the, the power of God to those who believe like a verb and keep on believing is what you have to do. Well, it's not acting like a verb. It's an articular present participle, which means it acts more as a noun or an adjective. More like an adjective here, like the believing ones. You see? Was that so hard? Okay, now we get to the part, to the Jew first and also the Greek. And the Greek could mean 
and often does, as it does here, mean um, the Gentiles. Because in the ancient world, there were Jews and there were Gentiles. And sometimes the Greeks, because they were Gentiles, would, would be referenced for all Gentiles. And I want to zero in on the word first. To the Jew first. The Greek word for first is protos, P-R-O-T-O-S. It's an adverb, and it means it's pertinent to prominence. First, foremost, most important, most prominent. So it's not talking about first chronologically. It's talking about first in being foremost. Now I have a quote from the pulpit commentary. It was to the Jew first because it was to the people of the covenant, his covenant people, and he has a reference here, Romans 9, 4, that the salvation in Christ was in the first place to be offered to them. Now, this shouldn't shock anybody. Who are God's people? Yeah. I mean, we are God's people in the sense that we are his children, but not in the sense that the Jews are. They are his covenantal people. He, they are the ones that he made all these promises to. That, and many of them uh, are still yet to come, or some of them, I should say. They are the apple of his eye. And so that it shouldn't in any way surprise us that that's the case. He goes on to say, hence, also, in all his missionary work, he first addressed himself to the synagogue, and only when he was rejected there, turned exclusively to the Gentiles. So at Rome 2, when he afterward went there, in Acts chapter 28, verses 17 through 29, that's Acts 28, 17 through 29. And you'll notice that when Paul, he was always traveling, went to all these different places, and as soon as he hit, he hit town, the first thing he would go to is to the synagogue. Why? Because the gospel is unto the Jews first. And I, I don't know what his batting average was, but it wasn't, it wasn't good going to the synagogues. These people have been obeying and doing their traditions, obeying the Mosaic law and waiting for the, Mosaic, uh, for the uh, Messiah. But the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes and so forth pretty well uh, had tainted that to the point that they thought they had to really work hard. The more they hard, harder they worked to keep the Mosaic law, the more they would be in the kingdom. And so uh, he was, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there, he was rejected at every synagogue he went into. I don't know how he did it, but I would always <laughs> think in my mind because Paul was fearless. And so he goes in there and, and, and this, I don't know how big the synagogue was. If it was a small one, small one like this, a small church, he goes in where people start talking to him. Where did you come from? What's your name? Blah, blah, blah. And he was uh, an apostle to the, to the Gentiles. That didn't really mean that much. But if they gave him a chance to speak, he would say, well, I've got good news for you. Messiah has come, and y'all crucified him. And you know that Mosaic law thing? It's gone. We have a new way of living, a spiritual way of living. And so you don't have to be concerned about all those feast days and holy days and traditions and the, the, the dietary laws. All that is gone. That's out. So we have something new. What do you think they said? <laughs> yeah, like this. Yeah. The 12 disciples were instructed to take the gospel only to the Jews. Did you know that? When they first went out, well, first of all, Jesus told them to go out throughout all the world and preach the gospel. Where did they stay? In Jerusalem. 
Remember right before he ascended, Matthew 28, go into all the world and preach the gospel. They stayed put. And that's one reason that they had the persecution there in Jerusalem because God had to push them out. They weren't going to obey. Well, they're going to obey one way or the other. That's the way God works. And so they went out through uh, the known world at that time, and they were told to go to the Jews first. For instance, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 6 says the following. These twelve Jesus sent out after instructing them, saying, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. Going to the Jews first could also be because there was contention between the Jews and the Gentiles, and Paul wanted to make sure that even though he was sent to the Gentiles, it didn't mean that the Jews had been abandoned. So that's another reason why he would go to them first. They had already been set aside. You understand that. It was in Matthew chapter 12, I think it was around verse 24, when they were accusing Jesus that he did miracles by the power of Beelzebul, that he decided, I'm had it with the Jews. And that's when he started talking in parables. Some people think, well, they talk in parables to make it clear. No, they made it, they, he, talk, he spoke in parables. So it would not be as clear. And only those who understood had a, some kind of uh, background or uh, some experience would understand how to put those together. And sometimes he would just uh, explain it. So that's when he started going to the Gentiles, but originally it was to the Jews. Now, I just gave you one. I had three others, but I didn't put them on here. I thought that would suffice because that tells you that they were only go going to go there. So now I have the completed, updated version, or, or the expanded version. You know how this is what I'm doing now. We go through all this. I give you all the particulars about the verse. And then at the end, I put the verse, and I put in, in parentheses, strike out this, add this, to where it is as close as I can come to what it, that, that will give you a meaning that's more understood. This is the way it sounds for Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Now look at your verse or somewhere so you can see the differences and you might be able to write something in here or there. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel for it, and then I have in parentheses there referring to the gospel, is the power of God for salvation. And when I put salvation there, I put after that in parentheses, deliverance from the lake of fire. Salvation isn't to co-op with you to have a better life. It's the only way that we can avoid the lake of fire is by the power of God in salvation. Now, two... And after that, I wish I don't have it up here. You could see it easy. But I, I mark through everyone who believes. I just mark through that. And in parentheses, what I put is the believing ones. Because that's an articular present participle, which means it's acting more as a verb, um, excuse me, as a noun or an adjective. And when you say to everyone who believes, everybody would think that's a verb, but here it's not. To the Jew first, and I struck out first and put foremost, and also to the Greek. So this time I'm going to read it exactly how I have noted it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the power of God for salvation, deliverance from the lake of fire, to the believing ones, to the Jew foremost, and also to the Greek. The Jews first, 
reminds us that Paul wanted the Gentiles to know that they were not replacing God's chosen people. They were being grafted into the tree, which was the Jews. I just thought I'd throw that in afterwards to make one more point. Now, verse 17. Are you all ready for verse 17? These two verses, verses 16 and 17, are the thesis statement of the entire book of Romans. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're going through them with a the fine tooth comb because there is a lot there. It's just like Genesis, the, the book of Genesis is the foundation for the rest of the Bible. These two verses here reflect what, what Romans is really about. This is an extremely important verse. It sets out the theme of the whole epistle. For in it... Did I read 17 yet? No, oh, okay, I thought it... Uh, let's, let's read it first. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. I should have done that first. So when it starts out... For in it, it is the gospel. We were just talking about the gospel. For it, the gospel here, isn't the narrow use of the gospel in the sense of only that message which is required to believe in order to have eternal life. But Paul uses the gospel here to refer in a plenary sense to the whole realm of theology that, thro that flows out of the gospel. So the good news can be specifically for the gospel, or it can be, there's a lot of good news in the Bible. The gospel is part of it, and when he's using it here for in it, he's talking about the good news as it applies throughout the Bible, not just for the gospel. Now we get to this phrase, <clears throat> the righteousness of God. And before I even go to any of my, any of my notes, I, I, I was on the way here, I was thinking about how can I explain this? The righteousness of God. Just a phrase. Everything in this universe depends on the righteousness of God. And the problem is that the righteousness of God does not change. It is immutable. God does not change for man, for nations, for anything, because his, his righteousness has to do with his justice and his character. The righteousness of God is related to being accountable to God because he doesn't change. And since he doesn't change and man is anything but righteous, then that not suggests, but cries out that man is accountable to God. And most people today don't have a clue how important the righteousness, righteousness of God is. It is extremely important to God. But today, not so much for the people. I, said, I think I said earlier, I might have said it in, in a prayer meeting, I can't remember. There was a time when people would give at least a measure of respect to Christians, to the Bible, to a pastor, to a missionary. No more. There is no respect there. These vandals that are tearing our country apart and burning down our cities. One reason they do that is because they know they are not being held accountable. So why not do it? And if you mention God to them, they probably laugh. Get angry. 
When you say He is a righteous God and you're not righteous, that means you're accountable to Him. And so, surely not now. I mean, if, if, if they, they're out there looting and, and attacking the police, stealing, raping, murder, and when they are arrested, they go in, if they're arrested, very few are, uh, they get out the same night. They, they say, well, you, they, there's no bail, so as soon as their paperwork's done, they go right back out there, and they're out, they're out there joining their other hoodlums and burning down the city. And I get so exasperated. I, I look at any, any metric you want to use to measure by, any people anywhere on this planet, and you start asking yourself, who is held accountable? And especially in this nation. The previous administration, it has been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that they broke the law. They grievously broke the law. Anybody that, has, that is halfway rational and open knows that. And yet, the people that should be behind bars are on TV squawking like they're somebody. The head of the FBI is a sanctimonious, self-righteous jerk. And I keep, I, I, I talk to my friend Greg, we, I talk to him at least three times a week on the phone when he's going to work. And I said, when is anybody going to be held accountable for anything? And you know what the problem is? They don't respect God. But when the Bible says the righteousness of God, it should make us shudder because we're not righteous. And we are accountable. And because of the fact that He is the most loving, wonderful, magnificent, stupendous entity that in the universe or any other universe, that He had His own beloved Son go to the cross in order to save our sorry souls. And people laugh at that. So this word, the righteousness of God, that's what the whole book of Romans is about. Let me get into a few notes here before I run out of time. First and foremost, the gospel is about the righteousness of God which speaks of His character. Is there a God who is just and righteous? That's what Paul was answering for these people in Rome. Paul's answer was yes, and his very first argument was going to be an illustration of this. He's going to talk about the negative side of God's righteousness, the wrath of God being revealed from heaven against all wickedness. That's what righteousness means. If God is righteous and you're not, and you're not going to adjust to the righteousness of God, then the righteousness of God is going to adjust to you. The subject of this verse, this chapter, and the entire book of Romans is that God is a righteous God, a just God, a fair God. The Romans worshipped many gods, but there wasn't even one that was righteous in their entire pantheon. Oh, they, they were considered to be powerful, but certainly not righteous. In fact, they were totally immoral, often cruel and brutal. This pantheon of gods that they had had a problem because they were attacking one another. They were killing one another. They were raping one another. They were doing all these things. That was the gods that they worshipped. And Paul comes along and he answers their question. It's kind of a rhetorical question. And that is, is there a God that is just and righteous? What would they have to say? No. You know, I learned some of this when I was studying astronomy. Because in astronomy, the, the names of the stars are after 
um, these pantheon of gods to a large extent and the um, narratives that they believed. And it is a mishmash of nonsense. And so when Paul came in and he said, now wait a minute, I know your gods are powerful, but they're also cruel. I think about Islam, and of course in Islam, uh, they say that Muhammad is the prophet, but Allah is God. They have no reference for how we think of the true God, the God of the Bible, because the Bible says that our God is what? Love. I don't even think love is mentioned in the Quran. They fear their God. Now, we're to fear our God, but it's not the same. We're in awe. And we are to show respect to our God, but they look at Allah as... He, he doesn't have to be righteous, you see. And he might have a bad day and take it out on anybody he wants to. They cower before their God. They, they try to do, they pray all this, what, just five times, seven times a day. They walk the walk. They do everything they can, not to be a good ambassador, but by fear that they might be zapped by this God. You see how important it is that our God is righteous? It embodies his character, his very essence. Okay we get to the point to where we look at the word righteousness. The word righteousness is dikaiosune in the Greek. That's D-I-K-A-I-O-S-U-N-E. Dikaiosune. It's a noun. It's a nominative singular feminine. And the BDAG lexicon has this for the meaning. Quality or state of juridical correctness. Now, I think I'm saying that right. It's J-U-R-I-D-I-C-A-L. I've never seen that word. I would say judicial correctness, but this says juridical. And I guess I don't, don't even know if I'm pronouncing it, but that's the way it sounds to me. I started to just cross that out and put ju uh, uh, judicial, but he says... Quality or state of juridical correctness with focus on redemption, re, excuse me, redemptive action, righteousness, integrity, virtue, purity of life, righteousness, correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. All that is embodied in the word righteousness. Dikaio Sunni refers to the thinking of a judge allotting to each what is due. See, it's a judicial thing. That is what the word actually means. It is the judicial righteousness of a judge. So God's justice flows from his righteousness. Because if you have a righteous judge, he is going to be what? Just. And... Let's see, I, I don't think I have it here. I might have it down here lower, but I'm going to go ahead and give it here. The word just is dikaioo. D-I-K-A-I-O-O. Dikaioo. is just, and it, you can tell it comes from the same root. So righteousness and justify, though seemingly unrelated in English, are related in the Greek. Righteousness is dikaiosune, yeah, and here it is, and justify is dikaioo. That's D-I-K-A-I-O-O. And if you wonder how important these words are, the two words righteousness and righteous combined are found 586 times in the New King James Version. I don't think they would be there that many times if they weren't very important. Justice is found 130 times. I was going to put how many times just is mentioned, but just many times, if not most of the time, he, he went just outside the building. 
that, that kind of just. So I can put it in there. But that shows that how important these words are. Now I'm getting very close to the end and I'm glad I got to this part. I got this quote from uh, Dr. Rob, Robbie Dean in his, in 06, I think he taught uh, Romans. This is a, just, just, no, just put your mind at ease and just listen to this. It's, it's a paragraph. It's a pretty long paragraph, but this nails what we're talking about in a, in a uh, panoramic view. The righteousness of God is revealed. See, we just got, we haven't got to the word revealed yet, but that's the next word. The righteousness of God is revealed introduces the topic, the subject matter of Romans. It is to explain the righteousness of God in relationship to mankind, to human history, how God's righteousness has been violated by the human race, and how God's righteousness is satisfied by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And how the righteousness of Christ, then, is imputed or credited to the account of the person who believes in Christ, so that they are saved, not based on what they have done, but based on the righteousness that they possess from Christ. This is the basis for God saying that they are justified. That covers a lot. But it flows. I think it's easy to follow. Yeah, of course, since God is righteous and we're not, we have a big problem, I'm, we being mankind. And so he gave the solution, and it took Jesus Christ going to the cross. And by doing that, he did not have to send us to the lake of fire. Had not Jesus Christ gone to the cross and paid for our sins, every single one of us would be doomed to the lake of fire. He was motivated by his own love and mercy and grace to do that. So he did that, and because he's done that, the only way to receive this free gift of eternal life, and I keep saying it's the only way God gives it is as a free gift. And when someone receives that free gift by the only method, which is faith, then at that point, they are imputed with God's own righteousness. Now, the way that happens is, that is a... Real imputation. God took our sins and imputed them to Jesus Christ on the cross. They didn't fit there. They didn't go there. He didn't deserve to get that. But real imputations comes in pairs. So when God imputed our sins to Christ on the cross, the only way that he could make it right to make it congruent is for us to receive something we don't receive that we don't deserve and what we we get that we don't deserve is the righteousness of god and when we believe the gospel it triggers that christ is already for us it's history christ is already was imputed with our sins and was victorious over that he said, it is finished on, on the cross. It's, it's a done deal. And now for us, when we believe the gospel, that faith triggers it, then boom, we instantly have the imputation of God's own righteousness. And when then, when he sees our, his righteousness in us, he says, justified. That's why we're justified. And all these people that are out there trying to be justified by their own works is a more than an insult to God and His plan. They have their plan. Their plan, they want to take credit for it. But 
That's the key right there, and it starts with God's righteousness. The righteousness of God in relationship to mankind, to human history, and God's righteousness has been violated by the human race. When did we violate God's righteousness? The moment we were born. <laughs> we come into this world with the imputation of Adam's sin and an old sin nature, plus then we have personal sin. So we violated his righteousness, and the whole human race does that. And how God's righteousness is satisfied? Well, it's satisfied by Christ paying the price. See, God has to be fair. He has to be just. He can't say, well, you know, you're such a good person. You're really special. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carve out a, a, a way for you. No. We violated it, and now, because Christ took our punishment, we can receive God's own righteousness, and the instant that we believe the gospel, boom, it's there. Eternal life is there. God's own righteousness is there. You don't feel them. You don't even know it happens. Usually, you don't. When you're, you go from an unbeliever to a believer, how many people know anything about the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the imputation of God's righteousness, how to be justified. You don't know any of that. Hopefully you find that out later and then you can have more appreciation to God. But all you know is that you were persuaded that this is true, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that paid for, paid for my debt. Boom, you have all of that. And then God sees that righteousness and says justified. And the rest of humanity that is trying to be trying to be justified by their own works will wind up in the lake of fire. There is no other way. God would God did everything He could to save them from it, but no, they don't care about His righteousness or His justice. They don't even think they're going to be held accountable. They don't need the cross because I can do my own works, and God better appreciate that. That's how I'll make. I'm past time. Let's close. Father, thank you for this time that we can look on these things. It's a dose of reality. We, get, we live in a world of fantasy and smoke and mirrors and lies and deception. This is truth. This is what we need to be getting out to the masses and not pussyfoot around and, and, and think we have plenty of time and mosey about it. We need to have a zeal to reach these people. They're on their way to the lake of fire and we have the only antidote to it and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we pray that you will help us to look for opportunities not only to give the gospel but also to tell others how wonderful and great our God is. Challenge us to do that and then give us the discernment and wisdom as to how to do it and when to do it. We thank you for this. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.